and welcome everyone. I am Nkeshi El Amin. I'm a sociologist of race and place and Black Appalachian experiences. I'm based here in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I am the co-host of the Black in Appalachia podcast. I'm so excited to see all of you here um, as we jump in into uh, this discussion. All right. Um, so for this particular conversation, is, uh, we're calling it the Black Colonial Experience, and this is um, a part of um, promoting the Ken Burns film, Benjamin Franklin, um, which is um, currently streaming on PBS. Um, some of you may have um, had a chance to see the documentaries already. Um, maybe some of you have not as yet. Uh, so hopefully, getting into this conversation can get you excited about checking it out. Um, and I'm super excited to be here today, not just to get into this, but to have a conversation with somebody that I hold very dear, dearly, um, a former professor of mine from Syracuse University. Um, for those of you who are listeners of the Black and Appalachia podcast, you know that I did my master's degree at Syracuse University in Pan-African Studies. Um, and for those two years, I had the pleasure of meeting and getting to know Dr. Joan Bryant, um, who is um, a professor of African American Studies at Syracuse University. She's an associate professor um, of African American Studies at Syracuse University, um, teaching in the area of African American history. Um, her research and teaching explores African American religious history and 19th century African American reformers' ideas about race. Um, she's finalizing a book exploring the latter issue entitled Reluctant Race Men, um, Black Opposition to the Practice of Race in, a 19th, in 19th Century America. Um, and again, when I tell y'all that I'm excited to, to, to be doing this with Joan, Joan and I talk a lot um, and we've been, um, I've been trying to find a way to, to do something with her in a public facing way. So this is really exciting to me. Um, I was a TA for her one semester, and then I took a course with her another semester, and since then, she can't get rid of me. Um, so, so I'm super excited to be here and to share with you all and to um, introduce you to Dr. Bryant. Um, all right, so welcome, Joan. Thanks, Nkeshi. Yes. So you should let everyone know this is a conversation, not, uh, not a lecture, so I'm Looking forward to talking with you and then hopefully have time to talk with people who are watching. For sure. And definitely our folks who are here watching, um, as we as we engage in this conversation, feel free to, to, to drop any kind of comments or, or questions in the chat and, and hopefully we'll be able to, to get to some of them as we as we go through the evening. Okay. So. Awesome. I share my screen now. You can go ahead and share your share your screen. Yes. Okay. So beginning. Sorry. Okay. So the the uh, the conversation titles is a, le a little less uh, magisterial than the uh, the. Colonial Black Experience. Um, so we we thought when we were trying to figure out how to approach such a massive topic that we would think about the different worlds that Benjamin Franklin navigated and, and relate that to the experiences of Black people. So, so the documentary explores you know, the colonial, British colonial North America and the early Republic through the life of one man a self-made man, which I think is an interesting concept. Um, and so we thought we would deal with individual figures and how they um, are situated and navigate the worlds that Benjamin Franklin navigated and tried to shape himself. So that's the conversation we're going to try to have. Um, and Keshi and I have lots of rambling conversations and this <laughs> might be one more. So we invite you to, uh, to join us in the ramble. So and Keshi. You. Awesome, yes. <laughs> So <clears throat> let's go to um, the first slide. Okay. Yeah, 
So one of the things that um, comes up very early on in the film is they're sort of setting the tone for who um, Benjamin Franklin is. Um, it, we learned that, um, you know, he was a, um, you know, a, a, an avid reader very early on, wanted to get a formal education, but his family had a very, a family that had many children. And so they couldn't afford to send him to school, um, you know, very much, I think beyond maybe the uh, age nine or 10 or something like that. Um, and so he, uh, you know, got out of school and, and maybe as an early teenager, adolescent age, he starts to apprentice. He, he became an indentured servant of one of his older brothers um, who had a printer uh, or a press, right? Um, and so Benjamin is under, is, is legally an indentured servant of his brother. And we learned that um, uh, this was not, you know, while he was learning the, the, the trade or the skills, um, his brother um, would beat him, right? And so he um, runs away. He, 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 he frees his labor um, by running away um, at, I think, age 17, right? So he leaves um, Boston. Um, was, it, was it Boston where he was where he was born yeah. and um, heads to Philadelphia um, and and even in that runaway in, in him running away he um, you know he gets on the ship and he tells the captain to like hush about it right like be like he's he's running away he's he is breaking his contract he is um, a fugitive right um, and so that's a, one of the first things that we learn about Benjamin Franklin is sort of in, in this um, larger narrative of the self-made man right and so we we want to talk about um the sort of this uh life of servitude um and a world of unfree labor and so that's the first thing that we're going to jump into this evening okay so this is literally a screenshot from the from the documentary and um you know, Franklin says that his brother, even though he was his brother, you know, considered himself my master and had often beaten me. And the they quote this the latter portion that I have here about the harsh and tyrannical treatment that he received. And and in his this is from his autobiography, and he says that that gave him a lifelong um, uh, sense of opposition, I guess, to tyrannical rule, which is you know, a question we can think about. But the idea here is that, that his status as a servant trumped the relationship um, that one might have with a, one might expect to have with a brother. And you know, so this, the documentary um, doesn't refer to the repeated beatings, but we certainly get that in the autobiography. So that's the first point. It's like this experience of being unfree labor um, for, for Franklin, is, is the start, and then we see it again. Um, I don't know if you can see all the screen. In, in the references to, in the film to his own newspaper, once he escapes, once he steals his labor for his, for his own use um, and ends up in Philadelphia, in his uh, newspaper, he, he makes money by advertising for the sale of human beings um, and Runaways like himself, so it's sort of you know this you know, paradoxical situation that his freedom is premised on the unfreedom of other people, and he certainly capitalizes on it. Um, David Waldstreicher, um, who studies Franklin, who's interviewed for the documentary but doesn't appear in it, um, he estimates it about a you know up to up to a quarter or up to one fifth or a quarter of the revenue that. Franklin generated for the Pennsylvania Gazette came from these ads for fugitives and unfree labor. So it's sort of an interesting sort of um, sense that he he might have had a, an acute sense of uh, of uh, the tyranny of, of abuse, but he certainly it didn't start, it didn't stop him from capitalizing on it. Um, but that's another story. So. Um, you know, since he's a self-made man, you know, he goes from being unfree uh, labor to um, a you know, successful man. I thought about the um, one of the early narratives of a black man um, in the early Republic, and that's Venture Smith. I mean, his name even says something about his status. I mean, he was <laughs> given this name um, by the person who purchased him um, as a slave. 
as a, you know, a sign of his status as capital. You know, this is a venture. This is an economic venture. And so that's his name. And he you know, becomes quite famous in the earlier public, hence this narrative you know, related by himself, obviously written down by someone else and crafted by someone else. But it is one of these early narratives of a self-made man. And the, the introduction to the narrative compares him to a Franklin and a Washington. You know, these sort of towers of the Republic that you see in this, you know, apparently a, he was a massive person um, in Connecticut. So, you know, this is sort of slavery in the, the free North, you know, at least the area when the area we think of as the free North, um, it refers to him in a state of nature or rather a state of slavery. So it has some sort of critique of slavery, um, but explains how he sort of like Franklin starts with nothing um, and becomes a, um, a, a towering figure in the, in the community in, in Connecticut. And he's, we don't have an image of him, we have this, you know, this tombstone, which is significant in and of itself. When you think about the cost and the you know, standard artistry, but the narrative is interesting because it, it does have resonances with Franklin in terms of um, how Venture Smith um, lives. I mean, he, he is a, an entrepreneur. I mean, he does all kinds of work um, and the narrative explains the kinds of work he does to, to gain money to buy himself. So in this, in this world he's inhabiting where humans are commodities um, and this is, you know, the economy, you know, buys and is, is involved in buying and selling people. He buys his freedom, um, he buys his wife and he, he comments on the fact that he buys her when she's pregnant so he doesn't have to pay for two people. Um, he laments um, the loss of his son. His son goes to sea when he, after he's purchased him and he dies and, he, and part of the loss is, is his son, but it's also the money he paid for his son. He invests sort of in people. Um, it's not clear whether he's buying slaves, but he's certainly buying their freedom and they feel indebted to him and he complains that they're not grateful. So he's someone who's involved in a world where freedom, even in the early Republic, after the revolution, after all the revolutionary rhetoric, which we'll talk about later, um, is still caught up in this world of commodification. And you certainly see it in his experience um, and how he navigates this unfree world and what freedom means in that, in that world is inseparable from the um, commodification of human beings whether they're servants or slaves. So I thought that this, you know, it's an interesting comparison, especially since even the people who um, helped him publish it thought of him in terms of these other self-made men who were part of the founding of the Republic. Keshi, you're muted. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Um, okay, so that's um, you know the the first thing that we are um, where we wanted to get into. But the other thing that we see here that um, you know when we think about Benjamin Franklin, we think about ele electricity, but we also think about um, the Revolutionary War, uh, right, and the independence of uh, Americans' independence. Um, but what we learn from this documentary is that. Um, Benjamin Franklin is an unlikely, unlikely revolutionary, right? Um, and, and so, you know, it's very clear that he is um, in favor of empire, right? And he tries very hard to um, keep the 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 colonies um, as as part of the of the empire, right? Um, you know, he he's maneuvering both worlds. He's traveling back and forth between the United States and England. He's living in England for some time, for extended periods of time, um, and he's you know trying to craft this um, uh, you know, words that would um, would ensure that this very delicate. Um, so, uh, you know, we're seeing this uh, America's on the edge of this thing that's come. This revolution, this revolution is coming, and he's trying very hard to hold on to to empire and to keep things um, at bay. This what seemed really delicate, and he's trying to um, to kind of to to keep from getting there. And even as he's he is um, he's writing his um, his autobiography, and he's and he's um, you know kind of def defining himself, he's making himself one. We see that theme throughout this, this, 
this um, this documentary. But then we see here at the at the brink of the revolution, he's literally actively writing himself. Right, he's working on this on his uh, autobiography. But at the same time, he has to stop. Right, he can't continue. He has to stop because this tension is rising so quickly, and the politics is getting. Um, he's being consumed into the, all uh, all of the politics. Right, and he's literally forced into being on the side of the colonies, right, and and fighting um, and 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 pretty much um, working to independence, right. So it, this was not something that he ne necessarily chose. We sort of pushed into it, right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, the other place where we want to look at what um, what's happening in this in this world of revolution and how are black people sort of brought into into this world as well. Okay, so as in case you said, you know, this is just a screenshot of Franklin sort of from the documentary, sort of starting to craft his, his autobiography that ultimately I think is fitting, remains an unfinished story. Since it's, you know, there's so much to him that is not clear that by the end of his, his life. Um, and his, his grandson ultimately publishes his autobiography, um, you know, sort of becomes a bestseller and continues to sell. Um, but the fact that he wanted to tell the story and he starts writing it in the revolutionary era is, I think, telling um, amid the chaos of his life. He's sort of, you know, trying to have a neat, a neat story, a neat narrative. Um, and I think that that's in some ways a, a nice way of thinking about the status of Black people in the revolution. Um, they are in some ways unlikely revolutionaries because it's, a, you know, we know that Black people are on both sides of the, of the war. Um, in some ways, it's, it's, it's quite a gamble for people who are in slavery. Like who's going, where will you have the greatest possibilities for freedom? Like, um, the chaos of war certainly creates an opportunity for people to escape and they do always. Um, but we know, you know that when, when people in Virginia first offered to be on the side of the British, you know, they were turned away. And then later Lord Dunmore you know, says, okay, you know, um, if you fight, if you join and serve, you know, we'll grant you freedom. The Patriots are a little more reluctant but we know that this, the war creates possibilities for freedom. And so I asked this question, you know, how revolutionary was the revolution um, when we think about uh, black people and, and what's going on with these unlikely revolutionaries, unlikely because we have to think about what's at stake for them. And I think they have to crack the stakes themselves because they're really not part of the conversation. And so I asked this question, you know, I leave the big question you know, for students, but this question about, um, that we want to think about now is about the extent to which the revolutionary era, era freedom disrupts the equation between blackness and servitude. At one level, you know, conceptual level, it would make sense that it would, since people are talking about universal freedom in the documentary, they refer to it. I think Bernard Bernard Valen refers to kind of the hypocrisy, and many people do. We can talk about that anyway. But um, I want to point out to one revolutionary, um, someone who's not typically talked about. Um, but he has you know, these parallels with um, Franklin in that he's an indentured servant in, in Connecticut, you know, in New England. Um, his mother was, was white, his father was you know, listed as, a, as an African. Um, so he's reared in a household of a, a white family. He gets an education. Um, he has an opportunity to even attend college at some point, but he decides instead to train uh, with a, a minister and becomes a minister to a white congregation in Vermont, you know, that bastion of black life in, in Vermont. Um, but he is someone who fights in the revolution. He's at the Battle of Lexington. And um, he also is someone who, I'll, I'll, my slides are out of order. He's at the Battle of Lexington. He writes about that. I don't know if you can see the slide with the uh, share screen, but he writes about the Battle of Lexington, sort of an example of his thinking of, the way that he deploys the rhetoric of the revolution in thinking about black freedom. So I ask in this, in, in this um, slide, you know, how did they engage the revolutionary discourse? Well, they expanded it. They had to expand it in an attempt to disrupt the equation between blackness and servitude that is prevailing at this point. And um, the title of his manuscript, we don't know if it was, if it was published. Um, it hasn't been, the published, a published version hasn't been located. We don't know if he preached this as a sermon, but it's called Liberty Further Extended. And we know it's you know, sort of given his references, it's probably around 1776. 
And it's, it's an interesting piece because of how he tries to expand the, the rhetoric of liberty. And it's a full blown attempt to challenge slavery in terms of slave trade, um, the principle of, of owning people. So it's, it doesn't just focus on the horrors and brutality of slavery, the treatment, it, it attacks the principle of owning people. And it pushes beyond even the, the idea of buying and selling people, which many people were horrified by the buying and selling, but they weren't horrified by the owning. And he attacks both. Um, and, and, and is very aware that the rhetoric of the revolution has to be extended if it's going to include black people. He understands that this is really about white people and he's going to, you know, he pushes for an expansion of the notion of liberty to, ex to extend to black freedom. Um, and basically tells all the slaveholders, I mean, that they're part of his audience, uh, you know, you're going to hell. So it's a moral argument, it's a political argument. Um, and it's, you know, people debate about whether it actually was delivered since he's a minister to a white congregation. Um, and ultimately that doesn't work out, but for, for many decades, for decades it does. But he's, you know, for people who question whether he actually spoke out against slavery, I mean, there is this poem and, you know, it's about liberty um, and the, um, what people are willing to do, you know, for liberty because it comes from God. And I mean, these, um, you know, the second and third standards are, are quite biting, much better there that is in the grave confined than a su surviving slave. Certainly, you know, give me liberty or give me death it certainly resonates with that. And then a message, even in death, we'd rather seek these silent rooms and leave us slaves to you. So you get the double entendre, he's not just talking about the British, he's talking about the, you know, the, um, the patriot, mm -hmm. the patriots who enslave people. Mm -hmm. um, he was quite famous in his day this is a, a, a serving tray and this is you know, how he's depicted. You saw his image and here he's depicted you know, with his, uh, in his congregation um, in Rutland. So he's a celebrity in his times. I think that's the last one I have for him that's on this. But I think he's someone who's not as well known as you know, Crispus Attucks, you know, who doesn't have words, but he has you know, the symbol of his death. Um, but he certainly spoke out um, in favor of the revolution, and then had you know, also wrote about republicanism, the principle of republicanism um, and equality among all pe people. So he's, he pushes that idea of liberty beyond the revolution to think about justice um, in this slaveholding republic <laughs> after the colonies. One of the things, Joan, that I really enjoy about your work um, is the way that it, for, for me, you know, and maybe for other people who are not studying um, this time period, it, it's sort of uncovering or bring it to the forefront, the ways in which black people um, in this colonial era and another, uh, you know, and, and later are really, um, really thinking in, uh, about race, about uh, slavery, about liberty, about their position in the society, right? Um, and I think that, um, going somewhere with that. Um, so, so I really, I really appreciate that piece and really um, being able to, to, to bring his words into this contemporary period, I think is really, I think it's really important mm -hmm. um, to do, right? Especially when you're thinking about somebody like Benjamin Franklin, again, who is um, credited as a self-made man, um, who, um, you know, is kind of moving through his career, has done all these amazing things, right? But, um, you know, he is, is sort of like, um, one, he has the luxury to do these amazing things. He has people who are enslaved and, 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 and working for him. He's also benefiting from, um, you know, this, he, he's, he's wealthy. He's able to retire from his printing, um, job at 42. Right. But, but you also have, so it's easy for you, for us to think about somebody like Benjamin Franklin as this great thinker, right. Of this time period. Um, but you have somebody like, um, like this, who is not living that same life necessarily, right? And others, right? Who are who are thinking and and being really outspoken about um, these matters that that are being uh, debated by the, the the highest of society, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's certainly the case with Haynes. I mean, he's involved in all the contemporary theological and political debates of of his time, um, and he has, you know, in some ways, he has the luxury, right, as someone who. 
um, can navigate you know, these, uh, you know, this, this free world where there are not many slaves and he's a free man and he's a you know, mixed race. I don't know if that mattered. I mean, he ultimately he parts with the congregation over, um, you know, they don't want a black minister. That's part of the story, but he's, you know, he's always front and center in these, in these debates and clearly invested in the life of the mind and soul, you know, as a minister, but um, clearly engaged um, in the central issues of the period. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So a, a, again, another uh, thing that they, you know, are um, dealing with in the documentary is Benjamin Franklin's relationship to um, black people. Like I said earlier, he um, had people, enslaved people working for him. Um, he talks about um, at one point where he, when he went to England um, and he writes home to his wife and he says, um, I think he went to England with two with two slaves, and he says one of them is good to me, but the other one ran away. Right? <laughs> um, they also kind of talk about like like um, he's he is very much committed to slavery. He's committed to he doesn't see black people. He, he black people are inferior to him, right? Um, um, and later in life, he becomes a part of these abolition societies and things like that. But um, you know, he, he even reflects on his own prejudices and he says um you know um he, he talks about there, there's one part of the book where he talks about the documentary where he talks about um the moment where he realizes that black folks like the, the, you know are are capable our are, are thinkers have the capacity to think right um he goes to visit this um this the school where these black kids he, there was a i guess his family had a, a a a black boy and they decided to send him to school and so his wife encouraged him to go check out the school so he goes to the school and he's impressed by the kids he's impressed by how um um how intelligent they are and how well behaved they are and this is supposed to be the moment where things sort uh, you know there's a shift for him right yeah so this is the slide <laughs> This is the slide, and uh, and they're you know they're quoting him about this um, you know his this this awakening, and I mean, he says he doesn't feel a need to give an account for his prejudices. Right. Um, I mean, he he implies that the, the, these are sort of natural things, and and even the um, some of the commentators say, yeah, yeah, it's natural, but he's 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 more reflective than that. He, right. he, uh, he acknowledges them as prejudices. Well, a lot of people did. Um, they just thought that they were right. Their prejudices were right. But anyway, so this is his. You know, this is the clip from the um, at least this, the shot of that of that scene. You know, they drew these um, off for this image. Um, and so it takes us to you know the per one of the people who becomes a poster child in the discourse about black inferiority, Phyllis Wheatley. You know, the person we learn about you know in the elementary school. And so, so these are questions I ask. And, uh, I guess you know, as I ask lots of questions that I don't answer, just you know, food for thought. Um, but I think about you know her, you know, navigating this world where she's inferior. She's from Boston, um, you know, uh, Franklin's territory, um, and thinking about what's at stake in 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 people's perceptions of her, and you know, to say something about the trial and and Thomas Jefferson in situating her in this world where black inferiority is assumed to be natural and certainly um, you know, cited as uh, a justification for enslaving black people. So here is uh, Phyllis Wheatley. This is the frontispiece of her collection, of, first collection of poems. Um, you know, she's, you know, she's uh, reportedly born in Senegal, um, you know, sort of captured when she was about eight years old. Um, and there's a, um, an experiment in the weekly household. They teach her to read, um, you know, but she doesn't just learn basic literacy. She's engaged in the classics. Um, and so this, this is the, the frontispiece for her collection here. And one of the things that's interesting is she, um, this image is attributed to uh, Scipio Moorhead, who's also enslaved in Boston. She, a, she has a poem to SM and she's praising his artistry. And so people think that it's um, that's a reference to to him to say something about this community of people uh, in Boston, people of African descent there. Um, 
But in thinking about how she's situated in this world of, of black inferiority, we look in part at the, the um, letter that her, her owner, John Wheatley, includes in the, um, uh, in the narrative, you know, describes who she, who she was, you know, brought, by, you know, brought to the US, brought and bought uh, when she was about seven or eight, and um, refers to her curiosity and how she's learned to write. And she's corresponded with an Indian minister uh, while she was in England. I'll mention that, uh, uh, Akam. And then she has a great inc inclination to learn the Latin tongue and, ha and has made um, some progress in it. This relation is given by her master who brought her and, and with whom she now lives. Um, so he's, he's vouching for her, her capacity. You know, she can write, she's read sacred materials, she can do arithmetic. And I mean, her poem, poems are wide ranging. At one point she writes a poem to the students at Harvard, encouraging them to uh, abide by you know, basic moral uh, <clears throat> standards, uh, which she did not want to do, I imagine. Um, but she uses her poems um, as a way of sort of writing herself into the public arena. And one of the things that's interesting, I won't talk about it here, but I usually bore students with it, is about you know, how, may, how many of her poems are about death and you know, the great leveler. And she writes about death a lot and the, the dead um, as a way of sort of, I say, you know, think, um, establishing her place and, and, and a certain kind of authority. But anyway. I won't digress at this, at this point, but in thinking about sort of the authentication that um, has to be uh, issued um, because she's navigating a world where she's supposed to be innately inferior and have no capacity, you know, this is this um, page, probably can't see it very well, but it's, it's a page that's included in, in the book and it has a list of subscribers and the people who um, can authenticate the fact that she has actually done this. It's like we whose names are underwritten do assure the world that the poems specified in the following page were, as we very rarely believe, written by Phyllis, a young Negro girl who was but a few years uh, since brought an uncultivated barbarian from Africa. Um, so even she can learn. And we see the, the doctors and judges and all the honorable people here who, who attested to her her ability. So I'm going to say something about her poems and then and, and then another sort of test. Um, so one of her the poems that she's probably most known for is the one you know people love to hate. And this is probably one of one of her earliest poems. She's you know, a teenager. Um, the concept didn't exist, but she was young. And where she's you know referring to the um, the providential nature of having been brought from Africa, the pagan land. Um, and then moves on to criticize people who say that black people cannot be um, you know, brought into salvation. But the first line just sort of you know, <laughs> dooms her in the, in the eyes of many that she um, would say such a thing. And it, in some ways, you know, the sort of a different kind of interpretation is to think about someone who's become a Christian, you know, which, and she, who's trying to ask that question about why bad things happen to good people. So this is not so much a question about white people, it's a question about God. And you know, you know, so God's action, if God is all powerful and God allowed this to happen, there, then there must be some providential dimension to it. You see this in her, you see it in Equiano, you see it in other people. Even when I was growing up, not too long ago, um, you know, I've heard people say, you know, older people say, oh yes, you know, this is, you know, this was the price they would happily pay to have come to the uh, to the old rugged cross. Um, so that's, you know, that there's a, there's a discourse that probably con continues here. But even in this early poem, she is critiquing people who are, who are, who are just bigots um, and even denounce the idea that black people can be Christians, which at this moment in Boston suggests a certain kind of equality, a spiritual equality. Um, but even, as she moves on, you can't see the, the um, the year, I think this is, and Keshe, you tell me on your slide, you know, 1773. 1773. Okay, so this is another poem um, that I think speaks to how she engages the revolutionary era. And we get a different idea of, you know, a different sense of how she's thinking about Africa. 
uh, I, young in life by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Africa's happy, fancied happy seat. So Africa becomes a, a, an idyllic place. She says, an idyllic place. Um, she says, what pangs excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breast. Mm. Steeled was that soul and by no misery moved that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case. And can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway. So we had a different, in this revolutionary moment, she's, you know, feels free to say, <laughs> present Africa in a different light and condemn, you know, her own uh, capture and, um, and relate to her parents in a different way, think about her parents at all. Um, this is another moment at this point, I'm sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me since I'm so juggling too many things. I think she's become free at this moment. Um, you know, the, the Whitley's free her uh, when the when the when the mistress is near death or at death. So they, you know, you know, she's a pet. She's trained, but she's not free until later. Um, but she has this um, connection with Samson Ockham, who is in some ways like her. He's native, a native person who's you know, Christianized and as a minister. And he's written something on the vindicating, vindicating the natural rights of, of Negroes. And so she writes back, you know, praising it, thanking him for it. And in this, in this letter, she, you know, does, you know, she repeats a line that you also see in Lemuel Haynes, this idea that in every human breast, God has implanted a principle, which we call love of freedom. It's impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. And by the leave of our modern Egyptians, so the Americans are the modern Egyptians. And she says, I'll assert that the same principle lives in us. This idea and that she has to assert that black people have a natural <clears throat> desire and right to freedom is, you know, tells you something about the times. And then you know, sort of I truncated this, but this idea that she wants to point out the absurdity of their conduct, that is the patriots, whose words and actions are diametrically opposed. I mean, she's thinking about the rhetoric of the revolution and how it you know, stands at odds with the enslavement of, of black people, um, these modern Egyptians. So it says something about uh, chosenness uh, as well. Um, Joan, before we move mm -hmm. on to the next one, you mentioned um, the artist that painted um, her picture. Um, mm -hmm. What was the name? Scipio Moorhead. Scipio Moorhead, right. And we talked when we were pre prepping for this, we talked about another artist that I think it's, you know, for me, that was the first time I was learning about that, about um, Prince Dama. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to just to just briefly, if we could just briefly talk a little bit about him as a as an artist, also in the same time period as a Black um, artist in this time period, living also, I want to say in, in Boston, maybe? Boston. Boston. In Boston. Mm -hmm. um, and, and um you know, and, and sort of really speaking to this, um, you know, Phyllis Whitley was not, um, you, you know, wasn't just, um, uh, 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 you know, oh, yes, there's the word, there we go. It wasn't just isolated, there were other people mm -hmm. in this time who were, um, you know, performing in the, or, or, or showing their, their talents and intelligence in, in these particular ways. Right. I mean, and, yeah, Prince Dama, if anyone used to could look him up, I mean, his, um, we don't have images of him, but we have images of his owners. He paint, you know, portraits of them. And they're at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, they, they you know, took him, I think they took him with, to, to England. So he had formal training um, as, a, as a portrait painter. And so his portraits of the, the couple um, survive, and I'm drawing a blank on their names, but if you look to the fount of all knowledge, Google, you can find uh, the images of, of that work. And so, you know, yeah, yeah he is in, in Boston. And I will say, I mean, so Dema, Scipio, Wheatley, and others are part of this um, question about capacity um, in, the, uh, in this period. I mean, these, you know, I talked about the stakes of, of their productivity. Um, we see it very clearly in the early Republic when Thomas Jefferson in his notes on the state of Virginia is writing about, you know, when he's envisioning freedom, you know, his plan is to, to, to educate the Negroes and send them away. 
um, to you know somewhere they can survive. I mean, for many reasons, you know, of course, they'll they resent you know they can't but be resentful, so they're they're dangerous. And then it has a long list of all the things that make them naturally inferior. From you know, well, they stink. They have nappy hair. You can't see them blush. You know, they don't really they know sex, but they don't love no love. And then he you know, sort of punctuates it by pointing to Phyllis Wheatley and Ignatius Sancho. Um, so you know Phyllis Wheatley's prowess. He was a poet. Ignatius Sancho in, in England, a <coughs> composer, he, he, um, a store owner, known as largely for his correspondence with um, many famous uh, British people. If you go to Google and find him, you'll see some of his compositions. Um, you can hear, hear some actually. But um, Jefferson cites both of them to basically saying, look, if this is the best you have, let me just tell you that they, they don't, they're really doing nothing. You know, um, Sancho, you know, sort of, uh, exhibits emotion, but not real intellect. And Phyllis Wheatley is no poet, not really. Um, so it says something about what's at stake in, in their accomplishments in, in this world of, of unfreedom uh, among, you know, especially in the revolutionary era when people are thinking about what kind of country they're going to build, what kind of republic this is going to be. Okay. All right. So the next, the sort of the, the the next point that we want to make is um, about um, the world that Benjamin Franklin imagines for uh, 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 in the colonies, right? Um, he talks about um, well, we already established that he wasn't a fan of the blacks, right? Um, but he talks about. Um, all of the potential of the colony, right? The colonies and how there were these uh, rolling hills, this, all of this land to be acquired and that this, and the white population was gonna double and triple, right? And, and surpass what was in, um, what was uh, uh, in England, right? Um, of course, these, these, these rolling hills and this land and land and land, of course, there were nobody else there, right? <laughs> but, you know, it's just sort of disregard of uh, the native populations that were there and sort of, um, you know, looking at America as this place to be populated uh, by lovely whites, right? By, by um, and, and, and at this time, he's, he's really thinking about, um, uh, um, you know, people of, 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 um, what is it? British bloodlines, right? Anglo-Saxons, right? Um, and so uh, that's another place that we we see. He really has this vision for um, what what the colonies will become, what what America will be, and it's very much um, a land controlled by and populated by whites. Okay, of a certain sort we'll talk about. So this is the clip from the documentary. You know, it refers to this. Um, his observations about the increase of mankind. Now, you know, this he started writing this in 1750, um, 51, and it's published in 1755 as part of someone else's work. You see, um, you know, the long title um, about the conduct of French and the group, and then it says, to which is added, uh, wrote by another hand, observations concerning the increase of mankind, peopling of countries. And so it's attached there and then you know, it becomes a freestanding. Uh, peace. So I think it's useful to think about the distinction between this, you know, the straightforward idea of Black inferiority, the inferiority of Black people that he subscribes to, and his vision for a white republic. You know, he's not the only one, as you know, just talked about Thomas Jefferson, who envisions a white republic. Um, so you free people and then you send them away. So his vision you know, was earlier but it's, it's pretty widespread. You see it in colonizationists and see it in others. And so here's the example, and I just would want to say something about it because it says something about his conceptions of race. And I can't read the top of my screen here. Um, and Keshi, what does it say? Oh, I think it's just the citation for, you're muted, the title. I'd have, I'd have to stop sharing in order to Mine see. Mine just, I see Benjamin Franklin. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is just the quote. And so he's thinking about white people and what he means by white people is not what we think of as white people now. Um, 
So, you know, he's referring to the purely white people in the world is small. And who does that include? Well, obviously not the Africans uh, or the Asians, but he says, and in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, and Swedes are generally what we call a swarthy complexion, as are the Germans, as in they're not like white like us, like the British. Okay, and what he wants is like people who are white like the British. And then, you know, then he goes on, and this is this last point is, is something that's you know stressed in the documentary, where he's you know at one point you know questioning the continued importation of Africans. Um, you know, it's like why do that when we can, um, you know, by excluding all the blacks and the tawnies uh, of increasing and increase the lovely white and red, the lovely white and red, clearly the British. So it's it's a it's a um, you know it's at a, he's writing this at a moment when the constructs of race you know, are more, are correspond to, to nations. So you can think about the Russian race, the French race, the German race. And you know, even if he's using colors, like he's making them different colors because these different nationalities are not the same. And so you know, that's the construct of race he's working with. And um, I think it's just an interesting piece because, well, for many reasons, um, says something about the the evolution of ideas about race, and it brings us to our last uh, person, and that's Robert. I'm um, um, James Fortin. So the, you know the, the heading here is probably James Fortin, because he's not here to validate <clears throat> to verify that this is him. So this is the portrait in the, in the um, uh, Philadelphia Library Company. This painting, a profile, and this is what we believe to be the first. Um, known daguerreotype of a Black American, uh, James Fortin. Uh, it's you know, approximately 1842, and it's assumed to be him. People say, well, one person says, well, but he, he, James Fortin was old at this point, um, but you know, he could look youthful. Um, but you know, when we think about you know, the people we know who could afford a daguerreotype shortly after it's uh, uh, invented, you know, he would certainly be one of the wealthiest, wealthy sail, sail maker, Innovator um, hired black and white people to work for his in his his company, but certainly wealthy in Philadelphia, and he um, he's someone who served in the revolution. You know, he's a patriot, and he was um, active. You know, early on, I think I thought I had another slide. No, oh, here it is. You know, he he writes these letters about. You know, letters from a man of color, he doesn't put his name, but everybody knows it's him you know, in, in the black press uh, concerning the legislation, legislation in Philadelphia about excluding uh, black people, um, uh, fugitives. Um, and this becomes the basis for one of his major, well, one, of his, one of his reform endeavors. He becomes the president in the early, in the antebellum period largely of what is known as the American Moral Reform Society. And you know, there are debates about whether they should call themselves American. These are, these are free men of color. You know, how dare they uh, suggest that? But these are people who are arguing for, for, re for reforming America, basically. Um, they're a pretty contentious group, even among free people of color. But one of the things they do, which sort of relates to Franklin's idea of whiteness, is contest it as a basis for reform, as a basis for rights. And I'll just read a. Um, one of the things that they, that he and his friends, um, sit, you know, say they are. Um, so Fortin, Robert Purvis, and, and and others, you know, they're protesting the legislature, and the pursuit of fugitives. You know, people who make it to this free, you know, this free territory of Pennsylvania. And here's what they say. You know, because the, well, I'll just read what he says. Um, this is a ban on migrants, basically, to keep out fugitives. Um, they say, you know, they're contesting it to rely us on arbitrary and dubious criteria of color differences, and that this violates the very principle of liberty. So the, the, the whole idea of difference, forget about hierarchy, just the notion of difference, they're saying, which is unnatural, violates that natural principle of liberty. And they said the attempt to regulate autonomy using, quoting here, the wavering and uncertain shades of white. That is, you know, distinguishing all these people and then the colored people, the way, you know, using whiteness, given how varied 
people in that time thought of it, we see how Franklin sees it as a varied construct, um, places freedom on illusory and unstable foundations. So I think it's quite interesting to have this person who's fought in the revolution, who's entered the early republic, sort of younger than Franklin, but he's sort of thinking about this vision of a republic um, that cannot be stable if it's going to be premised on these notions of, of, of race, of whiteness, because whiteness it's, itself is unstable. And I would say that um, he's the last person to talk to, but this is the start of a, an intergenerational discussion. His son uh, carries forward this um, idea. He's active in the sort of a next generation of reform. You know, after the Civil War, his son is involved in, a, in efforts to get the, um, the 15th Amendment passed. And he's horrified when he sees the, the language that says, you know, no one can be deprived of, you know, based on race, color, creed, or former condition of servitude. So he writes a, writes a letter to Charles Sumner, who's supporting the bill, and says, we don't want any, I have to get the language correct, we don't want any um, references to this contrived notion of color in, in the National Charter. Um, because putting that in suggests that it's just a natural thing instead of the contrived uh, invention that it was to, to create a hierarchy, a social political hierarchy. And so he, he, I mean, it's not just that people want, that he wants the right to vote. He wants the right to vote on logical, <laughs> valid grounds and right. racial distinctions don't fit. That don't make sense. <laughs> exactly. So that's, you know, that's part of this, this legacy of, of challenging this idea that, you know, that Franklin engages. And I'll just sort of close with a, a kind of coda that gets back to that idea of this, you know, these, um, this category that you know, this, these distinctions that Franklin has in the um, in this moment, and it's with um, you know uh, you know black reformers you know again in the same period when you know sort of the nation is redeveloping with Reconstruction, and you know so once people once black men get the right to vote, there's one reformer his name is Theophilus Stewart, and I'll just say he's from my hometown. That's why I'm talking about it really, but not really. Um, but he writes this piece in the Christian Recorder. This is the Methodist paper. It's its most widely circulated paper during Reconstruction. But he writes this piece that's called The Modifications in Race Idea Suggested by the Necessities of Modern Politics. And he has, and it starts with the founding of the Republic. He says the founders understood that in building the Republic, they had to have a race ship, that's his term, that was coterminous with citizenship. That if you're going to have a republic, the terms on which you define people as a race has to be the you know, has to match the membership in the republic. And so he says, now we've come, you know, so that worked with the founders. So he said they made all of these unequal races here, the Spanish, all these people who are in the colonies, you know, now in the republic, they made them all white. So nationality became, you know, you gave way to, to color as the way you define races. And he said, they did that, it made sense because they were the only people who were citizens who were voting. He says, now that you have black men who have the rights of citizenship, we need a new race ship. And so it's a, it's a quite interesting idea, intriguing idea, but it says something about um, the ways that, that reformers were envisioning the country and challenging parameters of membership um, in ways that certainly, um, Benjamin Franklin was engaged in. I mean, and, and Keshe sort of pointed to the, the idea that he you know, wants to expand the, the empire, you know, just ignore the native peoples that you know, we're going to get their land. Um, and we see that continuing you know, even now um, about expansion. But, but I think that these reformers, whether thinking about hierarchy or difference um, and freedom, sort of tap into this um, questions about race and nation and being self-made and the commodification of human beings that we see in Franklin's um, experience in his own self-making and certainly in the way that the, um, well, I'll, I'll say that the documentary touches on it. I think you know, we could probe more uh, with that. Awesome. So, so awesome. We have, we have some time for conversation. Yes. Are you, are you watching the chat? Or? Um, I've I, I was watching. I don't see any real questions. A couple of people asked about recording. Um, someone asked about uh, Prince Dumas. They wanted to look him up. I'm I'm guessing. Um, uh, but you all feel free to 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 
to put some questions or ideas or topics in in the chat that we can let's see looks like there's something here thank you for your time and effort putting this together it provoked a lot of thought uh in this old <laughs> bald cisgender white guy um try to be a solid ally but sometimes i'm less i'm pushed to plateau and quit learning uh this will take me to another level. Okay, we're taking folks to another level, Joan. Um, okay. And I well, think that- I, I want them to take us to another level, push us, <laughs> ask us questions. <laughs> so. Well, I think what, you know, thinking about another level, like I was really serious about, and you know, we talk about this all the time. I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, I'm excited for your book because I'm excited about really um, getting into uh, these black men who are reform reformers in this time period and 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 you know in the latter part in the 1800s um who are thinking about these ideas and and just have so much to say about it who we we normally don't hear about at all right and and, and as a sociologist and you know someone who's thinking and studying about race to you know it, we we sort of approach um you know we get the voice as the black thinker on race and that's about it right um and and that's du bois coming out in the, in the, the latter part of the 1800s um so to, to kind of go back even and to think about ideas that we're still thinking about and talking about that these um that these people were thinking about and talking about you know 200 years ago to me is really exciting um so again i want to thank you joan bryant for um for agreeing to 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 have this conversation with us um and uh, let's see, uh, definitely check out the documentary. As I said earlier, it is airing on PBS. Um, and if you are not familiar with the Black and Appalachia podcast, definitely check that out. Um, and if you are familiar, share it with someone else. Um, let's see. I have one suggestion too, um, for a different sort of angle on um, Franklin, you could, read Runaway America by David Waldstreicher, um, W-A-L-D-S-T-R-E-I-C-H-E-R. -E -E but he also has a lecture, a talk that he gave on C-SPAN um, about Franklin, which about his book, Runaway America, which I think is, is useful uh, to watch, to put in conversation with the, the documentary. Well, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank, thank you, Joan. You this has thank been you, a great uh, conversation. Definitely check out Black and Appalachia and I will see you all on the podcast, which will be, uh, the new season will be uh, airing at the end of this month. At the end of May, check out a new uh, Black and Appalachia season starts, starting. Okay. Thank you awesome. and thank you, William. <laughs> Shout out to Black and Appalachia team. All right. Uh -huh.